Joe. Joe on Joe is the only podcast where Joe talks about Joe. And now, your host, Joe Slepsky. Hello, listeners. Welcome back to Joe on Joe. It's me, your host, Joe Slepsky. And we're back this week for an exciting episode of Joe on Joe Illustrated. This is the podcast where we watch every cartoon, every commercial. Well, we haven't really, well, we covered commercials a little bit, I guess. But we do all the cartoons episode by episode, and we do all the comic books episode by episode, issue by issue, page by page, panel by panel. Do deep dives, giving them the attention they deserve with your host, me, Joe Slepsky. I uh, love you, Joe. Love you guys, listeners. And I'm excited to be back for what is a out of the blue, in depth Snake Eyes origin stuff. Like, there's this is this was a great issue, totally coming out of nowhere, leading you know from random Cobra Island Civil War shenanigans and uh, boot camp stories and. Yeah, redneck New Jersey sheriffs, and all of a sudden, bam, a Kage information dump. Like, this issue is awesome, so I'm excited to get into it with you guys. Uh, we are going to do that just after we hear from our sponsors, the Movies and a Meal podcast. Listeners, I know what you need in your life. You need more podcasts, and you also love movies. So why not do a podcast that's about not, not one movie, it's about not two movies. It's about three movies and a meal. I'm talking the movies and a meal podcast. This show is great. It's brought to you by Keith, Brad, and Ben. And each week they bring a new movie to the table, which they all discuss as a group. And it's not, you know, your highfalutin movies. It's what we do in the shadows, the Fantastic Four, Rise of the Silver Surfer, and Out of Sight. You know, it's Bad Education, Ghost Rider, and A View to a Kill. It's X-Men Last Stand, Queen Sugar, The Mandalorian, and Major League Two. They are a lot of fun to listen to. You guys know Ben. It's our friend Ben Penserga. He was a guest on Joe and Joe. In fact, Ben was the very first remote guest that I ever had on this podcast, so he's always got a special place in my heart. I'm really digging this. I, I just started listening to it last week. It is a lot of fun. They bring a guest in. The guest, uh, I, I listened to their Heather's episode. They, they were joined by Kelly, and she went in-depth on her favorite movie, which was Heather's, and it made me want to go watch Heather's to watch with them. I really dig it. So, guys, find them out there, at Movies and a Meal, Twitter, Instagram. Their website is moviesandameal.podbean.com. They put out one episode a week. Give them a listen, guys. Support them. Let them know Joe on Joe sent you. I don't think you're going to be disappointed. It is quite entertaining. And now back to the show. And while you're on the internet subscribing to Movies in a Meal, why don't you go over to Facebook or Twitter or Instagram and say hello to Joe on Joe Pod. That's me. Or if you're listening to this on uh, any kind of streaming app like Stitcher or iTunes or anything, hit that review button. Ratings and reviews help podcasts immensely. It gives signals back to the hosts that this is a popular show and so it promotes it. So anything you guys can do to help spread the word, you know I always appreciate it. And we are going to start this segment of... You were saying... With Marvel Comics. And you guys, if you're not familiar, You Were Saying is our segment where we look at other comic books that were on the shelf during the same month of G.I. Joe. So G.I. Joe 84 has a um, an off-sale date of uh, March... 1989 it was on sale in november 1988 and i gotta be honest first thing that catches my eye the marvel age uh number 72 because it's got a uh, a photo cover on it of the dolph lundgren punisher listen kids we are currently living in a very spoiled time when it comes to film, comic book adaptations. You guys, uh, we all love the MCU. I think universally the MCU is pretty top notch. There's some ups, there's some downs. For the most part, if you like comic books, there's something to like about what they've done with the MCU. They accomplish things that no one else has been able to do as far as telling you know giant epic stories across 20 movies and 10 years, all that stuff. Loki starts streaming this week. Actually, by the time you hear this, Loki should be available. 
uh, as I'm as I'm recording this, I see a countdown saying in eight hours it's going to be available over on Disney Plus. That is not an ad. That is a reality. But back in the day, movies about comic books were few and far between. So when we heard that they were doing a live action Punisher movie, boy were we excited. And then when we heard that Punisher was being played by Ivan Drago himself, He Man himself, Dolph Lundgren, the excitement lessened. However. Then you hear that it would also be co-starring Louis Gossett Jr. And then you went Chappie Sinclair in a Punisher movie? Sign me up. And then you saw the movie and hopes were dashed. It is uh, it is a Punisher movie, basically a name only. So strangely, it actually stays to the origins pretty well. Storyline-wise, it's, it's sort of honest to the Punisher, if you've never seen it. Um, uh he it, it's got just it's got a lot of trappings to it that were just 1980s tropes you know um travels through the sewers of new york you know find you know uh, uh, hunting his prey um so it there's no skulls in it guys there's there's zero skulls in the movie except for on the end the butt end of one of his knives so he shows that you see it a couple times at the movie he doesn't wear any skull paraphernalia etc um, there's a couple fun things about it. It's absolutely worth checking out. Um, Dolph is, uh, he's okay. Like he's not great, but he's, you know, whatever. He's okay for the action movies of the time. He's doing the kind of heavy lifting that they asked for. Um, I think my favorite scene is always the casino scene when he drops in from the ceiling and just mows everybody down. That actually was, that's a you know pretty dope moment. Um, there's, uh, you know, he's rescuing mafia children and it's just, it's not good. Um, there is a great scene of a guy in a car, like a mafia underling in a car and he gets like stabbed through the neck or something like that. And the look on his face was classic. And we did a, we did a tweet watch of this a couple years ago with my good friend, Seek Donnelly. And, um, it was, it was uh, really a joy, but um, yeah. So Punisher is featured on the cover of Marvel Age seventy two. All that to say, we're 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 living in the age of Punisher, about to be dropping in the movie theater. Speaking of that, Punisher War Journal number four, Jim Lee doing that early Jim Lee doing that Punisher artwork. Uh, those Jim Lee Punishers, all basically any early Jim Lee stuff, you might as well just pick up and hold on to it. They all seem to hold their value, um, even even books like this, which there's a lot of copies of. Um, and they're not really valuable books per se, but Jim Lee stuff, McFarlane stuff, all that, all those early books are, are, you know, are, are rising incrementally over the years. So, you know, it's, it's worth keeping in your, if you have a collection of Punisher and you're like, I don't want to read all these Punishers or keep them all, hold on to the Jim Lee ones. You might as well. They won't take up a lot of space and they're just going to gain value here and there. And you know, like when they're pulling from reference stuff. You know, people tend to, as far as like you know, making new projects and stuff, they tend to go like, "Oh, Jim Lee worked on it. That must be the, you know, the like the top echelon of of storytelling." So let's pull from that. That's a thing you'll notice a lot. Um, you'll see references in movies to books that may not be the best, but they had really, really great names on it, and it's because the people doing the research don't really do a lot of deep dives. You know, they're not looking into the. Um, you know, the, the Bob Wyasek years. Was it Bob Wyasek on Transformers? I'm looking at Transformers issue 50, by the way. It was on the stands. Um, I'm sorry, Bob Budiansky. That's what I meant. Yeah, they don't look like uh, Bob well, Bob Wyasek. He was an inker for Simon Said. Bob Budiansky. And, like, you know, they're not, like, deep diving into the Bob Budiansky catalog. Even though Bob Budiansky, he pretty much wrote all the backstory and the origins for the Transformers, you know. Um, so anyway, but yeah, we're at, uh, we're at issue 50 for the Transformers this is a giant size 50th issue with star scream triumphant. Finally, star scream is getting his day, his day in court between, um, that's the thing with, so Cobra Transformers, Megatron and star scream. So you had your leader and you had your lackey. Cobra didn't really have that per se. They had two leaders, you know, or three, if you count Baroness. You know, and it was it was Destro and Cobra Commander, and there was really not a subservient position because Destro never had um, 
He never, you know, he had his own thing going on. He had Mars Industries, so he didn't need to be that lackey. That's what's interesting is that is that, and you know, being written and created by a lot of the same people, it didn't fall. G.I. Joe didn't fall into that trap or versus Transformers. They were separate power structures because you could see it. You could see that there, there could easily be a thing, and and I guess you get a little bit into the sniveling with Doctor Mindbender, both in the comic and on the cartoon, where he was always playing both sides, but. I never got the feeling that Mindbender wanted to run Cobra. He just wanted to be with whoever was powerful, right? They're really, and, and then, I guess what? So when you when you add Serpentor to the mix, rest in peace. Uh, when you add Serpentor to the mix, I guess that puts Cobra Commander in the role of Starscream. But he's still Cobra Commander, though. I mean, he's still the Commander. So there, it's I always I always like that 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 they weren't carbon copies. You know, they weren't. Um, you know, the same power circle because over in Transformers, it was Starscream just wanted, you know, to be done with Megatron. He was, he was like, I'm, as soon as I can get this guy out of here, we'll all be better. That's not really the case. And I mean, there've been flare ups over the time, you know, over time with Cobra, but Zartan's doing his own thing. Mindbender doesn't want to be leader. Baroness, maybe a little bit, but she's certainly more competent than Starscream ever was, you know? So yeah, I think it, uh, I like the difference. I like I like that, that there's there's differences between the two very similar properties or you know related properties. Uh, GI Joe European Missions Ten was on the shelf the same month. Special Missions Nineteen. Uh, the Inferno over in the X Men books was wrapping up with New Mutants seventy three. Cool thing that happened in New Mutants was um, they de aged Ilyana, so they took Colossus, his little sister, who had grown up in limbo and became an became an adult and became a you know late teen woman when she really should have been about eight or nine or ten, uh, and she spent ten years in limbo. She came out. She was Ilyana. She was as you know, Colossus was like, oh my sister. Uh, so when they came out of Inferno, she actually was a little girl again, and they played with that for a little while. She ultimately works best as a, you know, kind of a rough and tumble young lady you know mature enough but I, I did like that they they took that change and gave that gift to peter you know that he could see his sister grow up a little bit because uh, i always like i always like colossus i don't know how you guys feel about colossus i was always a massive fan of him really really good uh character west coast avengers number 42 so this is the john byrne era everybody um if you've watched wandavision then um you know this they took most of that show from this um and from this burn era i mean they took a lot of it from a lot of places but pretty much all the stuff with wanda going kind of losing her mind in grief and even more so frankly more so i think than house of m because House of m even came from this so this era of west coast avengers was starts at 42 um where the vision gets kidnapped and stripped down to his parts and he comes back as quote unquote the white vision, you know, like he's and it's a all that really was was a visual way to show that he's different. Because if you keep drawing him the same, then you just in 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 the only thing different, you know, like is his emotions. There's no real reminder to the readers that this is a different guy. Uh, which I thought, while I didn't love the the all white just looks weird, which is actually well, you know what? I mean it was really effective because it does make him look just weird. And vision is supposed to be weird. I think we got too comfortable with him, So I guess that works, but I never really liked it. I can't say that I loved it. Um, but that's visually it's talking about comic book language. That's why it was perfect to have him just be absolutely looking different. Cause there's no reason he had to look different. It's not like, I think they said something like he was drained of his blood or not blood, but energy or something like that. But that's, that's just an excuse to draw him completely different. And uh, I think it worked. And of course, you know, 30 years later, you get WandaVision out of it, which I think was a whole lot of fun. So that's it for uh, Marvel Comics. Let's go over to DC. You were saying? And see what was on the shelf in March of 89. Well, on the shelf in November, off shelf day. You guys follow. You guys know what I'm talking about. I feel like I'm always going to have to fix myself. Just, just catch myself. Black Hawk Volume 3, number one. This is the follow-up to the excellent Howard Shaken miniseries. Uh, and um, Marty Pasco? Did he write this? Let's find out real quick. He did. Marty Pasco wrote it. And Pesky Pasco, he wrote some G.I. Joe stuff, guys. Cover art, uh, Rick Burchett. And he also did the uh, pencils on the interior, which uh, I always liked his stuff. And 
his stuff was very much like Mike Paroback, that um, oversimplified uh, cartoon stuff, like, very much like uh, Bruce Tim. Um, I think Paroback and Tim do it um, a little, a little better. But I do like his. I do. I do like Rick, Rick Burchett's stuff. Um, so that's a fun series, the um, the Black Hawk one. Um, Cosmic Odyssey wraps up with issue number four. You guys, we've talked about this. Um, really great. Really great miniseries. Uh, I'm glad to see it's getting some more recent love. I think probably with the, the rise of Jim Starlin's name, you know, as related to, um, you know, Thanos and all that stuff. Um, Doom Patrol 20. This is that second issue of the, the Grant Morrison. Uh, that's always exciting. What else do we got here? Manhunter number 11. This is um, it's a good, it's a solid run. It's a solid, like, workmanlike story. Um, it's not Paul Kirk. It's, um, I forget his name, but it's related to the Paul Kirk. It's one, I think he's supposed to be, was he supposed to be one of Kirk's clones? But it was the Manhunter that revived the name because DC has to put out a Manhunter book every once in a while to, in order to, you know, keep the copyright. Um, and then he, he used to, like, he first showed up on the scene as the privateer. And then, uh, and then he, you know, then he took the mask and wore the mask of the Manhunter, and it, it, it did it tied in with the uh, the Paul Kirk and Walter Simonson stuff. Uh, and then he, recently he came back as a full on bad guy, I believe. I think he's the bad, yeah, yeah. Memory service. He's Bendis uses him as the bad guy in uh, behind Leviathan, which was the big underground criminal network that no one knew existed, and now that we know it exists, I don't know that anyone really cares. Um. I enjoyed the Brian Bendis Superman stuff. Um, you know, his Legion stuff was okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not in love with it, but I don't hate it, certainly. Um, but, man, I don't think the world cared. I think it was a blink and a okay for the Superman stuff. And the lasting thing that he did of of aging John Kent, I think, uh, is okay. But I feel like more people wanted a younger John Kent. Why age him? Why waste? Because you... You have this great opportunity to have this young Superboy run around having fun, and we have to age. We're in such a rush to age him, so you can have a younger Superman running. I'm not a fan. I, I wish they'd kept him as a young kid. Uh, anyway, that's a tangent for another time. Uh, Lee Fox, The Phantom, Volume Two, Number One, The Ghost Who Walks. We were talking about this last week because the uh, what was it? The the Inker. I forget his name. Um, he. Uh, or the, the co or rather, I'm sorry. Uh, was it two weeks ago? Yeah. We worked on a bunch of Phantom and Mandrake stuff and everything. The Phantom is just weird. I don't get them. I don't hate them at all. I've enjoyed some stuff with them, but it's always just so strange. It's so out there. It's such an out there idea. Maybe that's, I think that's the appeal. You know, kind of like the white, um, the white vision, you know, where it's, it's supposed to make you feel a little weird, like a little like, huh? You know, huh? So yeah, so that's it. Uh, DC's got some other, you know, some decent workmanlike stuff. There's some the Riddler guest stars over in Question, which again, the Question is a great series. Um, Legion, more Emerald Eye shenanigans. Um, yeah, so it's just some. Uh, yeah, we had we had a, I think we had a big month last month. This is just kind of a kind of a month month. Let me see. Was there any? What was the Justice League stuff? I don't see any Justice League here. Look at this. That's odd. I don't see it in Justice League listed. I wonder if either this page is just missing it or if the Justice League missed a month. That's interesting. Oh, let's do our Action Comics check-in. Uh, they finally they do have Superman on one cover. And then I think this is actually, I think this is the last issue of the weekly experiment. Uh, it's Superman holding like Green Lantern's empty costume and all the other characters behind him. And these are all the characters that had starred in Action Weekly. So I'm pretty sure this was the last issue action comics weekly and so with 643 we'll get back to uh uh next month you you know you get back to normal action comics adventures which of course involves superman which of course they do and yes i just looked ahead and yeah 643 is the back to normal action comics so that's it for you were saying and now let's dig into gi joe number 84 now mass is ready all right this cover is Awesome, Ron Wagner, Bob McLeod. Um, it's a it's a representational cover. GI Joe does not do a lot of representational covers, um, and I'm talking about stuff like uh, the last time was the um, uh, 
I mean, maybe it wasn't the last time we saw one, but one of the biggest ones is that Grim Reaper holding the M16 or the M60. Uh, and he's, and it's the one where the soft master dies and Billy, they all get in the car wreck and everything like that's a, that's a representational cover. It's not exactly something that's happening inside, but it's, but it's also not a pinup, you know, it's saying that the specter of this is happening. And here we've got these, um, we've got a pool of bubbling lava with these stone pedestals that people, that two red ninjas are standing on holding Cobra commander in front of a, of a, of a glowing visage of Zartan as he rises from the, uh, the bubbling, uh, the bubbling lava or, or oil or what have you. Um, it's great. It's great. It's nuts. It's great. And, um, it's, you know, he's, it's, it's Cobra commander on trial or he's being held captive by Zartan or whatever it is, but it promises you that stuff's going to go down in this issue. Um, which is awesome. It just really, really great. It's a, it's a, it's an all timer cover. It's probably, yeah, it's, it's a great cover. And it also actually very much keeps you in suspense as far as, um, what the inside is. It doesn't necessarily, doesn't say like more ninja shenanigans, you know, like, or more snake guys inside. It's just all Cobra Commander and Zartan on the cover, but we all know what's inside. Yo, Joe! Converging Destinies. Larry Hama script. Marshall Rogers, penciler. Randy Emberlin, inker. Rick Parker, letterer. Bob Sharon, colorist. Bobby Chase, editor. Tom DeFalco, editor-in-chief. And and it uh, the splash page is sharp. It's nice. It's storm shadow looming over. Um, you could if you know the if you know the books, you could guess that it's Billy because he's got an eye patch. But otherwise, you just see someone in in Storm Shadow's old gi, without the um, the Cobra Snake on it. So there's like there's symbolism here of you could say it's uh, the new Storm Shadow about to purge the old Storm Shadow. Um, there's the the student trusting the master. Like there's a, there actually is a lot happening on this page, if you if you kind of know the story. If you don't know the story, you open it up and you go. That dude's about to chop that dude in the head with a sword. Yo, Joe! And we see, for the first time in many, I don't know, I know it's, I'm sorry, it's not the first time. We've seen it a lot before. But every time we do, my brain goes, that's awesome. Is uh, Billy claps, you know, the sword with his hands to stop the the forward momentum. And he actually, in this, in this panel, he, he ends up like kind of judo flipping. Storm Shadow over his head. Um, but just anytime, anytime a ninja catches a sword like that, you know, like putting their hands on it, they stop it is, uh, first of all, it's awesome. Second of all, my, 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 my animal brain can't help but going, Oh, that's gotta hurt. Like it's gotta cut your hand up. Like I get it, but it's gotta cut your hand up and it's awesome. I love the move. So he, um, it's Storm Shadow imparting, uh, Zen wisdom onto Billy talking about, um, opening your mind, uh, to master the spiritual nature of being a ninja, you know, attain the power to cast violence away from himself without resorting to the same. In this case, he cast it away by catching the sword and, and, you know, pushing, you know, like flipping storm shadow away from him. So it's symbolic as well as, uh, practical and functional and storm shadow continued to ask him, you know, what about subtext? What's a trick question? And, um, Billy says, uh, we can't ever know what it all really means. To think so is to surrender to delusion. We must question everything. But how does one contemplate the void while questioning everything? And Storm Shadow replies, it's a good question, Billy. By the way, my old ninja gi seems to fit you perfectly, confirming that Billy is, in fact, wearing his old Storm Shadow outfit. Yo, Joe! But while they're chit-chatting, they, uh, because, you know, they're ninjas, they hear something coming in off the uh, the, the fire escape. And um, someone's trying to quote unquote sneak in uh, two women. Now, if you guys remember how last issue ended, last issue ended with a woman uh, surprising or, you know, confronting Jinx uh, at the Presidio and pulling a gun on her and saying, I'm Billy's mom. Take me to Billy. So we see some legs here and wearing the same kind of purple outfit the mom was wearing. You could surmise that that's who it is. And sure enough, you get to the bottom panel and, 
And she says, uh, if I don't see Billy standing in front of me in exactly three seconds, your friend gets a, a, a 45 caliber lobotomy as they you know enter the dojo. Meanwhile, when they did, if you look closely, it's, it's a nice, quick little uh, piece of art. All you see is Storm Shadow's legs, and it's moving with that um, that blur speed. So he's jumped up into the rafters and leaves Billy to uh, to confront this woman uh, on the on the ground, the floor of the dojo. Yo, Joe! And Billy says that voice, I know it. And she counts down two, three, and she actually starts pulling the trigger. You see the trigger move. This is uh, this is cool. I like this. I like the way that this page is laid out. The, um, the left panels of Billy's reactions are nice. This all takes place in this span of milliseconds. Liter- well, I guess literally three seconds or two seconds. Where the woman's about to pull the trigger and shoot Jinx in the head. And Storm Shadow flying from the, sh- from the shadows. About to strike down this lady. Who, by the way, Billy's mom. High slit skirt. Let's talk about this for a second. Jinx. <laughs> Jinx wearing... You know, normal, modest, GI uh, military skirt. Uh, Billy's mom's that skirt slit up to her waist. I don't know what she does for a living, but she's ready for action. And so is Billy, because he moves like a blur. Yo, Joe! And he uh, demonstrates that sword catch technique that he did earlier, and at the same time, he kicks the gun, which absolutely goes off uh, away from Jinx's head. Um, it's a, it's a great sequence. It's uh, crazy fast. And we get some more lessons here. Storm Shadow says, we don't take any chances when one of our own clan is in danger. She threatened Jinx and her mission and her mission is to kill Billy. And Billy looks at her and says, she never intended to harm Billy. And, and this is great because she doesn't know who Billy is. She doesn't recognize him because remember the kid standing in front of her. Uh, he's much older than when she last saw him. He's missing an eye. And he says, these folks have adopted me into their family and given me the means to put my life back together. They're not holding me hostage or only prisoner. Mom. Mom, 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 mom. A gasp. You're my Billy? Yo, Joe! What did they do to you? Your eye. And he recoils in grossness. Um, I love this because it, um, this whole sequence is great. So Billy points out right away. All right. So it's great for a lot of reasons. The first thing she sees is that her perfect little boy is no longer a perfect little boy. Right. And that's disappointing because that's the first thing she sees, which is shallow and, you know, not what, you know, Billy recoils in horror. He then takes that and immediately goes to, yeah, well, I got a fake leg too. I guess I'm kind of a letdown if you're expecting a dream child. And Storm Shadow steps in and smacks Billy across the face about sass talking his mom. And then Storm and, and Jinx leave him alone uh, so he can work it out with his mom. But, like, there's a great, it's just a great dynamic here because, you know, Billy's growing up, but he's also a, a little kid whose dad was a terrorist and his mom abandoned him, right? So, um, I dig it. I do. I dig it. Uh, and then I like the. I just, I like the choices and it's very, it's simple. Uh, it's, it's a simple close up on Billy's face. You see the recoil these. I like the way that the background in the top right panel, you know, works as kind of a pseudo highlight to show this, this emotion, you know, it's not. Um, so look at it. Green, the green, the blue and the orange panels, all that background shading or, or um, you know, stippling is all different. And it's all to give different emotions. So this, the green one is this sense of, you know, vertigo, or you can imagine like this zero in of, of, of disgust on Billy's part. And then it's shared with the mom in that second panel where that um, you've got, it's blue colored blue, but it's this, um, it's almost like, it's almost like they're sharing energy and it's, and it's just this negative energy. And then when you get to the orange panel in the middle, when Storm Shadow breaks that up. So now all all that energy, pardon me, girls, they're very interested in G.I. Joe energy. Speaking of that, actually, that might be my uh, Lady J arriving. So the orange panel, like, diffuses the energy. Um, and it's, 
It's really represented by that, but that's not what's important, guys. So I just paused the show, and guess what? We're having a we're having a surprise unboxing, is what we're having right now. That, my friends, uh, was my dog going crazy because the mailman just showed up. So I'm gonna open a box that I got from Hasbro. That's right, my lady J arrived. Let's check it out. Let's see what we got here. Surprise unboxing. G.I. Joe, classified Lady J. Now you guys know I'm not an action figure guy. So I am not going to look at this with the same eye that some of my good friends on Twitter and on the other pods do. But I'm going to tell you this right now. I think she looks great. The detail on this is fabulous. They've got, oh, the, the, the heads for her staff are interchangeable. That's really, really cool. Two like two knife ends and one probably like a grenade explosive tip end. That's amazing. She's got a little Bowie knife that looks like it fits in a holster. That's fabulous. Her backpack looks great. Um, I don't know what you hook that. That like a oh, it's like a camera. It's like a backpack camera. This figure looks awesome. I, my Flint arrived yesterday, and Flint looks really great too. Um, and obviously they're a pair, so you know that's win win for everybody. So yeah, here's my classified Lady J. I'm excited for this. Literally mid mid show, everybody. Mid show, the GI Joe love never stops stopping. Yo Joe! All these years, I thought you were dead, Mom. I thought you were dead, but she never stopped searching for Billy. And he says, Dad told me you had died in a car accident, car crash rather. And this is where we see that a young Cobra commander who looks remarkably like Cliff Clavin uh, is going to, you know, it's all a flashback. We're going to start all over again, Billy. Things are going to get better. So out of nowhere, remember in the comics, Cobra commanders that is thought to be dead, we're getting the origin of Cobra commander from Billy's perspective. And we see Cobra commander talking to all these people and all these, you know, in crappy hotels and stuff while Billy played military guy. Cobra Commander building up his business. Our strength is in our unity. We can win back our birthright. Uh, we're going to sell vitamins and cleaning products. Better yet, we're going to sell the idea of selling vitamins and cleaning products. You know, pyramid scheme stuff. Like our birthright. This is all very, you know, just going to say. It's ideas they really, unfortunately, haven't really all gone away over the years. Uh, but Billy says he's never had any time for me because Cobra was taking up all of it. And we get more of this, I guess what I'd call energy background, um, where there's this, just this, you know, instead of doing the details, they focus you on the two characters because they have to meet in the middle. And so they have this standoff. And if you're looking at the bottom middle panel, see what I'm saying? It's a, it's a full black background with this um, kind of a rough hue and like aura around both Billy and his mom. And it's all, it's all very, very rough, like rough edged. Billy says, you know, I used to dream about what it would be like to have a mother like all the other kids. And then they hug in this final panel and that energy is dissipated. And it's like in the background, it's um, it's like a like picture, like a sound wave file is sketching across the background. And they also choose Marshall Rogers chooses to make these panels shrink. And get and there's no reason for it. There's plenty of room above it. He could have had these panels cut across, but he chooses to make them smaller and smaller. And by doing so, it makes it makes the space that they're having more and more intimate and mean a lot more. Um, so it's like it's it's almost like the cameras receding to give them this this time together where they're they're hugging and they're you know reconciling. Yo, Joe! Introducing the DJ machine once again. Meanwhile, over on Cobra Island, uh, Cobra Commander has decided he needs to murder Zartan. <laughs> And then remember, this is not Cobra Commander, Cobra Commander. This is uh, Cobra Fred Mander, remember. This is Fred Mander. Um, so at the end of uh, the Cobra Civil War, mean you know, Cobra Commander seemingly won, but he doesn't trust Zartan. He knows Zartan is, uh, he, or he believes Zartan is going to make his own power plays. So with all the dreadnoughts in New Jersey, as we've seen in the last few uh, issues, uh, Fred Mander says, you know, what better time for Zartan to meet with an unfortunate and untimely accident? A fatal one, of course. 
than when he's alone and unguarded. And in a, in a really cool, just a fun bit of functionality, uh, we see that, cover, that Zartan's main hut slash house slash home base constantly changes um, looks. You know, it's, it's under holographic metamorphosis in order to keep people unsure exactly what they're looking at. None of the troops, uh, Vipers and CGs, none of them are very happy about this. Yo, Joe! Now you can take your favorite Nintendo titles with you anywhere. Nintendo Game and Watch lets you play Donkey Kong or Super Mario Brothers in a car, a bus, or even in a tree with your friends. You can choose from 24 titles. Now this is pre-Game Boy. These were dedicated games that just had one game on them. And the watch they just reissued. You could actually buy this watch uh, again as a modern um, you know, piece of tech. And it's got a great piece of art. Although, it's got well, it's got Donkey Kong and then Donkey Jr. Or Kong Jr. In a tree with a... It looks like it's supposed to be you, the player, holding one of the uh, the boxes for the, um, for the game. And possibly the most evil Mario that's ever been drawn by, by Nintendo. Um, Mario looks uh, absolutely sinister. He looks like Wario. Let's be real. But it's not. It's Mario. So, uh, so get this watch before Mario murders you in your sleep. Now, Mindbender and Cobra Commander, I, this page is great because without warning, it flips upside down. The, the text balloons are right, but the whole page is upside down. And from this, we get red ninjas jumping from the ceiling or the floor or somehow. They're jumping into play, and they take the whole page is upside down. They take Cobra Fredmander into custody. They don't care about Mindbender because uh, they don't care about him. But... Um, Mindbender and the other guards are like, um, yeah, you know, we're just, we're going to go. Or, well, actually, take that back. He says, I suppose we have to make a token effort at getting him back because the uh, the ninjas have kidnapped Fred Mander. Yo, Joe! And he's demanding to know what this is about. And this ninja is very mouthy. He's real lippy. He says, shut up, Buckethead. We all know about your plan to quote, accident, you can make your explanations to Zartan in person, and then he, like, the floor orients itself properly, and he seemingly drops Fred from the ceiling. And Zartan is sitting there on a throne of skulls. It's got to be an illusion, but it's an effective illusion, because uh, Zartan is just on a throne of skulls, everybody, surrounded by red ninjas, and they take his helmet off. Um, Fred's screaming about the anti-tamper device in it, plastic explosives to blow up and we learn that Zartan uh, had his ninjas um, deactivated months ago the red ninja his red ninja friends are quite handy at that sort of thing and he says I made my original deal with the first Cobra commander it's about time uh, he had a little business conference with the current administration Yo, Joe! so the cat's really out of the bag for Fred the writing's on the wall his time is uh is, is lying to people about who he is, is really wrapping up. Meanwhile, back in San Francisco, all the ninjas are hanging out and they're having some um, some dinner. And we're getting some explanation about, uh, about what happened with the history of Cobra Commander. Uh, so Billy's dad, Cobra Commander, uh, first began to fall apart when his older brother, Dan, was killed in a car accident. And Storm Shadow... I think is well aware of all this stuff. He says, uh, you know, car crashes. It's funny how car crashes keep coming up in the story. So this is where we learn that Cobra Commander's brother, he was, he himself was in Vietnam and he kept extending his tour so that Billy's dad, Cobra Commander, couldn't be sent overseas. So if the brother stayed over there, then the little, you know, like the, the full family wouldn't be drafted. So the longer his older brother stayed, the less Cobra Commander was called on to go to Vietnam. And when he finally came home, he was different. He started taking long rides on the interstate, speeding and weaving. So he had a lot of PTSD. He had a lot of issues. And when the inevitable finally happened, Billy's dad couldn't face the possibility that he was the cause of it all. He was convinced that somebody else was to blame, and they'd have to pay. So he blamed his business failures on everybody. And this is where Storm Shadow asks, was there another vehicle involved in the crash? Yo, Joe! And she says, I don't think we've gotten a name for her yet, by the way. That's the worst part. There was a family in the other car. And we know this is Snake Eyes' uh, parents and sister. And they were on their way to pick up their son returning home from the war. And uh, 
her husband, Cobra Commander, turned it all around in his head and he blamed the family's surviving son for Dan's death. He was still held that grudge. And when she threatened to leave Cobra Commander, that's when he took Billy. And so Storm Shadow replies with, uh, what if I could say that I told you I could tell you the exact date of the car crash and the number of the interstate it took place on. I like this. He's down to the interstate, down to the mile marker. Um, the thing with this picture, and this is this is very similar to the way it was drawn in the other um, the other retelling of this, is that Snake Eye's sister was a twin sister. She is always drawn as being a child, just an absolute child, uh, and that's never that's always been a little weird because she's supposed to be his age, and you know he had finished his tours of duty. He had multiple tours. I think he probably was, even if he enlisted early, he probably was twenty one at least, right? Twenty one, twenty two, maybe. Anyway, so we see uh, a quick flash to Mama and Papa Snake Eyes. Two people that don't get enough love. They're, you know, they're, come on. They're as pivotal uh, to the origin as, um, you know, Bruce Wayne's parents. Come on, people. Yo, Joe! So now we're getting the furtherance of this. That's why this issue is great. We're getting the furtherance of this origin story from Zartan to Fred. But it is 100% just about Zartan's deal with him, right? So we see when Zartan first met Fred and we get to see Zartan without pre Zartan, like pre, you know, um, death's head makeup, pre, probably pre camouflage, like, you know, all of it. He was hanging out at a Daytona beach dive called the don't fall in second. Uh, it's the second, uh, restaurant pun, right. Or, or like, like, uh, like storefront pun didn't, it? yes. It wasn't the, um, the name of the hotel in the last one, something like the do drop in or something like that. And, uh, with his face obscured by the pool lights, Cobra commander is seeking out Destro who is playing pool with some, um, uh, bikers and Zartan, arms Destro, sorry, Zartan and Zartan's not dressed at all. Like Zartan. He's just, he's wearing, you know, like shirt, he's shirtless, but he's, you know, got a vest on and jeans. He just looks like a biker for sure, but it doesn't look like Zartan. And, um, first thing we see is Cobra commander, well, I guess, you know, that's, that's an awesome bit of real, that's a cool, so his Cobra Commander's tie is loose, right? And so with his tie being loose, well, one, he doesn't know how to tie a tie very well. Let's get real. No, yeah, actually, no, yeah, it actually, if he more, he tightened it. Yeah, so here's, this is a great bit of detail. Cobra Commander does not know how to tie a tie. Because the drawing of it, the, the front part of the tie is way too short. And the skinny part of the tie is way too long, and the tie is not even around his neck. If the tie is if the tie is loose, I mean it's not even tight around his neck. It's loose around his neck. So if the tie is loose around your neck, the skinny part should be even higher up on there, and the t- the big tongue should be closer to your waistline. That tongue is halfway through his midsection, and if he were to tighten it, it would be up by his nipples. So first thing we learn about Cobra Commander carries a grudge. Second thing we learn about Cobra Commander, does not know how to tie a tie. Third thing we learn about Zartan, he's really good at pool because he makes it like one bank shot and it knocks all the paws in because he needs to talk to Cobra Commander uh, about this proposal. Yo, Joe! Now, as he's talking to him, the uh, the devils, the this biker gang, the devils, they say, look ye here, Dristin. He says, it's Zartan. He says, we don't abide by no hustlers. And so, meanwhile, Zartan, I, what I love here is Cobra Commander's still just talking to him. He's still just feeding him the information. And he shows him a picture of Snake Eyes all bandaged up, that this is the guy who's responsible for the death of his brother. Meanwhile, uh, Zartan claiming not to be a hustler, which I believe him. I believe. He just was playing pool. Uh, he beats these guys, meanwhile, uh, listening to Cobra Commander the whole time. The other great thing, comic comic language wise, is in these flashbacks, all the all the bubbles are um, have rounded edges, right? To, to to denote that it's it's in the past, that it's a different time frame than the square edged uh, frames of, of of the panels. That's an old school comic trip. I feel like they don't do it a lot these days. Yo, Joe! And Zartan continues and finishes his beating, and then proceeds to uh, accept the challenge from Cobra Commander, and. He is told that the target was a long-range recon airborne ranger qualified with all NATO and Warsaw Pact small arms. This is like, reads like his file card. He's currently residing in training with a clan of ninjas in Japan. 
is that too challenging for you? And that's when he stops and says, oh, my expenses are paid in advance and non-refundable. Balance is paid on completion. So Zartan likes the challenge is what we learn right there. Yo, Joe! And Fred's expression and surprise on this page is exactly what ours is. Like, just like that, you infiltrated a ninja clan. Do you think I was born yesterday? Tell me another one. You know, like what kind of, you know, and then the ninjas kind of threaten them. Uh, and Zartan says, one should not cast aspersions on my veracity in front of my boys. Are you ready to hear the rest of my narrative? So first of all, let's also point out that Zartan apparently runs not only a bunch of bikers, but he also runs ninjas. That's cool. And we see that old, um, that old like Kung Fu lesson trick where Zartan went and he sat in front of, um, a certain professor Onihashi. You know, Onihashi, if you guys recall, was the sword master for the Rishikage clan. And he sat in front of it for, uh, day from day to every day from dawn to dark for six months to apply for an apprenticeship. That is a lot of sitting for six months. Yo, Joe! Now, before we go, we've got a holiday sale here from American Comics based out of Gainesville, Virginia. Let's see. They've got some holiday specials. It says all orders received by December 10th. Because remember, this was being published in November of 88. All orders received by December 10th will be shipped in time for Christmas. That is a promise from a John Byrne She-Hulk. Uh, we've got some specials. We've got Akira number one, first print for only three dollars. We've got uh, oh, Marvel Masterworks starting. Yep, the hardcover Marvel Masterworks twenty four ninety five. You get yourself get your Roger Rabbit graphic novel for four ninety five. Now let's see. I like to look at some of the key books here. We've got an amazing Spider Man three hundred. They are limiting you, limiting you to just one copy, but you could get a two ninety eight and a three hundred. For only four dollars, guys. First appearances of Venom, first cameo, first full appearance, only four dollars. That is a steal. You can get yourself Batman Year One for only two dollars and fifty cents. And this is apparently American Comics was one of those. Um, they were like they were newer books. You don't see I don't see a ton of Silver Age stuff in here. So like their like their FF only goes back like to two hundred. Yeah, so they were more of a modern age, modern age dealer. But they've got calendars, posters, the 1989 Calvin and Hobbes calendar. I actually think I had that. That was a great calendar. I love Calvin and Hobbes. Anyway. Yo, Joe! Finally, Professor Onihashi consented to interview him in the garden. He, you know, he says, you're persistent, blah, blah, blah. If you're going to do this, you know, you will go to any lengths to prove the pureness of your intent. Oh, he says, well, he calls him. He says, you're a liar. And a vein of bad karma runs through you like the coal seams of Hiroshima. And Zartan says, you know, I've done bad things in the past. What more must I prove? And the challenge is to prove the pureness of his intentions. But he says in the end, they're also false. So he, Onihashi is taking on the challenge. He wants to endeavor to temper Zartan's soul in his humble furnace and perhaps hammer out the impurities to make a keen and honest sword of you. So that's really cool. Zartan goes there with the intention of playing this guy. And I'm, maybe Onihashi doesn't know these are to murder snake eyes, obviously, but he knows that he's deceitful. And Onihashi looks at it as this is a test for me. Karma, you know, life has put this man, this troubled individual in my path. And as a guy who tempers steel and takes the hardest substances and molds it to his will, that's the that's the um, that's the life lesson that's been put in front of him, um, which is such a cool twist. Like this is such a great level of of character that you know wasn't needed, but is so welcome here. That it, it's not that Zartan was fooled anybody or it was great at what he did. It's that he was so just such a dirtbag that he himself became a challenge to a guy with uh, much more honor than Zartan probably ever will have. Yo, Joe! And now they're naked in the, um, in the snow. No, I'm just kidding. Well, they are, but they're, um, they're doing like the old, um, like hot water bath thing, you know? And, and, um, what they're doing is, uh, Onihashi is saying they're, they're purifying themselves before they create, uh, these, this sword, right? So they're, 
they're finding their souls so that they can then find the soul of the sword. I think that's kind of how they're doing it. And they're talking about hammering each piece of steel 50 times, each fold doubling the layers until they were beyond number. Soft steel has strength, but takes no edge. Hard steel takes an edge, but like a razor, but it's brittle and it breaks. So we fold hard steel over soft over and over until they seem as one and they each retain their original qualities. So you have a, a, an unbreakable sword with a, with a razor sharp edge and you see, um, Zartan using it in his, you know, in his full thong look to cut a piece of wood very much like Snake Eyes did, um, you know, God, like 40 issues ago when they were training in the Joe, in the pit. Yo, Joe! And now we see this is, uh, this is neat because without saying it, we're still in Zartan's dream world of Zartan using his illusion stuff. So now he and Fred are on some kind of like crystal pedestal. And as Zartan's telling this story to him, you know, you could imagine the world around him is swirling. Um, and Zartan himself, as they presented the, um, the sword to the hard master, um, Zartan was starting to, you know, uh, Onihashi's tempering of Zartan's evil ways was starting to take effect, right? So all Zartan wanted was to help that, that old man create beautiful swords. And I love this second panel on the right. It's something out of a Nightmare on Elm Street movie. And it works with this story that Zartan's weaving. Because you could almost imagine that panel almost tells you that all these images we've been seeing is what he's been showing Fred. Which isn't necessarily, it wasn't necessarily in my head until I got to this panel. Because sure, Zartan's got that holographic technology. He could, he, you know, he could act out all this stuff. He could show Fred all this stuff, right? So when you get to this panel, when you see this snake with a hood, Cobra Commander hood on him, um, and his narration is, uh, it came to him like the serpent he always was. He threatened to expose me unless I fulfilled the contract. You can almost see that this is part of the illusion that he's casting to Fred. And then we get a rehash of the death of the Hard Master, where uh, Zartan, dressed as uh, Storm Shadow, thinks that he's assassinating Snake Eyes, but it's really Hard Master impersonating Snake Eyes' is breathing. Joe! Got a bullpen, bullpen bulletins page. Say that five times fast. And while he was off assassinating uh, the Hardmaster, he says, I was a fool to think that, that Professor Onihashi wouldn't know. And he knew the darkest secrets of his heart. And so Onihashi kills himself. Zartan says, there was only one way to atone for the shame I had brought upon his forge. And he comes to see uh, Onihashi had committed Harikiri. And so Zartan lost everything he ever wanted. And since that moment, Storm Shadow has been hunting him. And he doesn't believe that Storm Shadow has given up that vendetta. He, he's still on guard there. Um, but then we learn that Zartan says, I'm going to fix that for good. I'm going to get Storm Shadow before he can get me. And, uh, and randomly, he's going after him tomorrow. So Zartan just jumps on a, on a helicopter and takes off. But that's just that's just a just a tragic end to that whole story, and and st adding such layers to the Snake Eyes, uh, Storm Shadow origin stuff, uh, and Cobra Commander stuff. Yo, Joe! And so we're back in San Francisco, uh, Storm Shadow is is filling in Billy's mom that the other car was uh, Snake Eyes' family, and we learn that Jinx and Shadow. They knew Zartan was the assassin, but they were never really sure why or what the motive was. Uh, and, um, you know, she says Cobra Commander never mentioned a name, but it all fits together. And, and um, you know, guilt has kept her going all these years. And that is a high slit, that is a high slit skirt you're wearing, Mama, Mama Billy. Just throwing it out there. Uh, she deluded herself into thinking they could work things out even after he disappeared. She kept a room for Billy, and she has, still has all his toys in his clothes. So that means she has vintage uh, G.I. Joe action figures, because he was seen playing with uh, an army guy, which I can only assume is the old 12-inch uh, G.I. Joe. So, um, Billy, you're sitting, Billy, you're sitting on, a, on a gold mine. She's kept it for you. Maybe even some Star Wars mint-in-package figures. So she was welcoming Billy, Billy back. She can't give him back his life. Um... But she wants Billy back in her life. Yo, Joe! And he says, uh, if someone's going to have to watch out for you, if you're going to run around with a pistol in your purse, so it might as well be me. So Billy and his mom 
are going to go and get, they have an apartment in Berkeley. She's in the picture now. Everything's great. It's amazing, as, as Storm Shadow says, pretty amazing how events seem to come full circle. And as that happens, an, a, a, a newspaper gets dropped at his feet. And it says, the De Jong Museum to show artifacts, which we know is where Zartan thinks Storm Shadow is going to be. And we get teased for the next issue of wordless ninja action, guys. Wordless ninja action in the next issue. So that is exciting and get ready for it. Now, before we wrap up, we're going to hit the post box of the pit. We've got, a, uh, we've got the first letter from CKG out of Marquette, Michigan. And she points out something that we pointed out when we went through uh, G.I. Joe issue number 77. Uh, you guys disappointed me. I mean, hey, while Lady J and Zerana were fighting, the other Joes and Cobras, all male, I must add, just stood around there like it was a mud wrestling show or something. And then at the end, the guys just stood around saying dumb things like, who won? And I hate it when it comes down to this. As if two women were fighting for their entertainment. Come on, you guys can do better than that. And then uh, the editor, uh, probably was, yeah, it was Larry, says uh, a similar sentiment was, was expressed by Roxy Devun Shake of Denver, Colorado. So I wasn't the only one to notice that in issue 77. We got a letter from Ryan Fox here. We've got Kevin Brash out of Tampico, Illinois. Brash. Um, Mike Leonard. Cherry Tree, Pennsylvania. Ryan Fox, by the way, out of Lakewood, Colorado. Mike Leonard, Cherry Tree, Pennsylvania. Are you still out there, Mike? And then uh, and then we get a little thing here of Larry clear, clarifying um, where the Joes exist as far as like crossovers and, you know, um, you know, like universe stuff, you know, because we've got G.I. Joe. They had, um, they're eventually going to have those crossovers with the Transformers. They had the actual crossover with Transformer miniseries, but that wasn't written by Larry. Obviously, they crossed over in the cartoon. And here we got straight from Larry. It says, the Joes exist in a universe inside his head. That's the events depicted in the TV show and the movie never took place. In fact, I've never seen them. In my universe, Scarlet and Snake Eyes have been an item from the beginning. Duke has been the top sergeant, not the, quote, leader. The fridge doesn't exist! Which is a slap in the face to this Bears fan, Larry. Uh, I don't believe in super. Larry says, I don't believe in superheroes. And I stand behind my original statement of vigilantism. I shouldn't have used the X-Men as an example. Uh, so yeah, he's talking about his series Wolfpack with dealt, that dealt in a in kind of a realistic way with vigilantism. So what he's saying is, the Joe, and, and he says, I've never read the Joe Transformer crossover, so I can't comment on it. So he's saying that that's all not canon, you know, for Larry Headcanon. Um, I'm, I'm interested to see what happens when they get foisted on them. Cause I'm pretty sure, uh, and that sound you hear, that's me cracking that, cracking that, uh, that comic bag and sliding it back in. I'm sure. I mean, if that's not, yeah. So yeah. Uh, interesting. Cause I, yeah, I'm sure that was foisted on them. And like, you, you need to do these crossovers. Like, I can't wait to reread those. And we got a good, we got a ways to go. It's probably, I think that's like 30 issues from now or something like that. So plenty of time between now and then. I love this issue, guys. I loved it. Um, I like that it built up the world of, of the uh, of the the Storm Shadow, Hardmaster, Snake Eyes story, but really was Snake Eyes was just a character in it. It really was more about the Rishikages and Storm Shadow's family and Zartan's bit in it. It really fleshed that out. Um, if you guys don't uh, never heard it, the, uh, t- two years ago we did the. Um, uh, uh, my special missions episode where um, uh, we re we kind of spoofed on my favorite murder, the podcast. And we had um, my wife and Lizzie Turner uh, along with guest star Xandar. They reenacted, they told each other the story of the hard master death and it incorporated some of this stuff. Um, so if you guys never heard that, Check it out. It's called uh, My Special Missions. It's one of our special episodes. I'll I'll re I'll re up it in the feed so that you guys can hear it. So if you're listening to this and you never did hear that one, um, I think it's funny. I think it, it it's it's very much in the vein of the uh, Cold Slither episode we did. It's you know like a mockumentary podcast, and it was a whole lot of fun to do. And I think the all the, the girls, the ladies, just absolutely knocked it out of the park. It's, uh, it's very much tying in with this episode of the show. So I'll I'll re release it this week. And uh, 
hopefully you guys will enjoy that. So give that a listen. Thank you all for giving this a listen. I appreciate you so much. And uh, now you, Joe, I'm going to play with that Lady J. And Joeing is half the battle. (laughs) 